Let's scoot on to a new topic. In this particular lecture, we're going to be talking about first derivatives to classify. We're going to use first derivatives to classify min and maximum values. Now, here's the deal. In a previous lecture, we realized that if we took the first derivative of a function, it actually helped us find the slope, right? Okay, in this particular lecture video, it's going to help us to determine minimum values and maximum values of a function. But before we get into any applications, we've got a few definitions and theorems to go over. So let's look at this first definition. This definition is dealing with increasing and decreasing, recognizing how a function is considered an increasing function or a decreasing function. Cool? All right. So here's the first part of the definition. It says a function f is increasing over i, which is some interval, if for every a and b in i, with a less than b, then f of a is less than f of b. Okay, so, you know, in math, sometimes theorems and definitions can really be a mouthful. So after you read it once, let's go back and pick it apart and see what it's telling us, right? So, this function f is considered increasing over an interval i. So, here's something we need to understand. This interval i is representing the domain. If, for every a and b in i, which means a and b are part of the domain, because they're in i, and a is less than b, that's cool. So, you know, if I give us a little graph right here, here's a... Here's B, this is the number line. A is less than B, right? Then, F of A. What does F of A mean? I know A is part of the domain, but F of A means we did what? Yeah, we plugged A into the function, and now F of A represents what? The domain still, or is it the range? Yeah, it's the range. And f of b? The range when you plug in b. So a y value, right? So this is part of the range. Both of these are part of the range. Which means, graphically speaking, if this y value when you plug in a is less than the y value when you plug in b, then maybe it looks something like this. Mind you, I'm just giving us a quick sketch because I'm a visual person, so I like need to see these things. So now, when we read it from left to right, f is certainly an increasing function because it's going uphill. Does that make sense? Okay. The great thing about math is when you understand one part of the definition, the other part is a little bit easier to get. So let's look at the second part of the definition. A function f is decreasing over interval i for every a and b in i. So what does that mean? Yeah i is still the domain, a and b being in i, they're still the domain, and a is still less than b. So, you know, on the number line, a is still going to be less than b. That's not going to change. Got it? Okay. Then f of a, which means what? Good. This is the y value, right? This is your range after you plug in a to our function is greater than f of b. Yeah, the y value when you plug in b to the function. So now this y value for a is larger than this y value for b. So now it's obvious that this is decreasing when you actually look at a graph. Does that make sense? Okay, so understand something. This definition is telling you how to determine if you've got an increasing or a decreasing function. And we just did a quick sketch of each part of the definition so we could visually see it. Does that make sense? All right. Now, this definition leads us into this theorem. And this theorem is actually going to be talking about the first derivative and how I can tell by the first derivative if a function is increasing or decreasing. With me? This is totally visual. This definition is totally visual. As we can see, this theorem, without graphing, will tell me if a function is increasing or decreasing just by looking at the first derivative. 
So let's look at this first theorem. First off, the function has got to be differentiable over that same interval i, which means it's the domain. Cool? All right. If the first derivative of x is greater than 0, greater than 0 means it's what kind of number, positive or negative? Positive number. So if my first derivative of x is greater than 0, it's a positive number for every x in i, so for every number in the domain, then f is increasing over i. That kind of makes sense because if it's greater than 0, it's a positive number, so that kind of alludes to an increasing function. Cool. The second part of that theorem says if your first derivative of that function is less than 0, which means it's negative, for every number, every x in that interval i, so for every x in the domain, then f is considered a decreasing function over that interval. So being a negative number means it's decreasing. Okay, that kind of makes sense. That, that, those two kind of go together. We think of positive numbers of increasing and negative as decreasing. Got it, but I'm talking a first derivative now. Increasing and the first derivative decreasing. Or, let me rephrase. When I take the first derivative and it's greater than zero, increasing. When I take the first derivative with less than zero, it's decreasing for every x in that interval. Cool? Okay. We have a couple more definitions and theorems to go over before we actually get into some practicality. So be patient, stay tuned, and I'll be I'm back with a couple more definitions. So let's take a look at the first definition. It's a definition of a critical value. Here's what I'd like you to think of a critical value as. A critical value is actually a turning point. It can be where a graph is increasing and all of a sudden hits that critical value and then it may start decreasing. Or maybe it's decreasing, it hits this critical value and then it starts increasing. With me? Okay. So the definition of a critical value is this. How do you find a critical value? A critical value of a function f is any number c in the domain of f for which the tangent line at this point is horizontal or for which the derivative does not exist. Now, let me go back. Let's go talk about that again. So a critical value of a function f, so some function f, is any number c that's in the domain of f. So C is just some number. I don't know what it is, but what I do know, it's in the domain of F, which is a good thing. And then it starts, not only is it in the domain of F, but then it also says, for which the tangent line at this point, C, right, which is in the domain of F, so that's like our X value, and what's F of C? Yeah, like the Y value, so this is our X and Y basically, right? for which the tangent line at that point is horizontal. So if you have a horizontal line, period, and I know it's a tangent line, which means it touches the graph how many times? Once. So if it's horizontal, what's its slope? Yeah, I've got a zero slope, don't I? This horizontal means my slope, my m, is equal to zero. Or the derivative doesn't exist. So here's the thing. If you're going to have a critical value, here's my IE, if C is going to be a critical value, then, then F of C, right? C is a critical value if F of C, its Y value exists, and the first derivative at C equals 0. The, the slope of the tangent line at C actually equals 0. Or that first derivative at C doesn't exist. Now, we're going to do some examples on how to find a critical value, so we're going to delve into this definition a little bit more, so don't get too, like, wait, what exactly am I supposed to do? Hang in there, okay? But this definition is going to help us. Now, remember what I mentioned. A critical value is considered a turning point. So maybe it's increasing and then it decreases. Maybe it decreases and then it increases. When, when we find that critical value and it's showing us where the function is actually changing, it can actually help us discover relative minimums and maximums. So let's look at this definition. 
So I is the domain of F. All right, so that's some interval domain of F. F of C, so C is that critical value, right? F of C is a relative minimum if there exists in I an open interval. By the way, I remembered, I just remembered I forgot to explain what an open interval is. An open interval has parentheses around it, no brackets, right? So F of C is a relative minimum if there exists I in I in the domain an open interval I sub 1 containing C. And I'm going to stop there a second. So within my domain, say my domain, my interval I goes from here to here. It says if there exists in this domain an open interval I sub 1. So in other words, there is a smaller domain that they're talking about. They're looking at only a section of the big domain. They're only talking about just a small section of it. That's what they're talking about. And this small section of the domain contains my critical value C. Such that when I plug C into the original function, so this is now what? An X or a Y? Yeah, this is the Y value at C. It is less than all the other y values for which x is an i. It's less than all the other y values. So if I've got a y value and it's smaller than all the other y values, then this is considered my relative minimum. Cool? Okay. Again, when I understand one part of the definition, I'll understand the other part, because now this part's talking about the relative max. So f of c, right, it's that critical value plugged into the function, is a relative max if there exists in i an open interval i sub 1. So same scenario as this. That contains c such that now f of c that y value at C is now greater than all the other y values for all x and i, which means now this is a relative maximum. You know, like, what do you mean by relative? Notice how they're talking about this interval i sub 1. It's a smaller part of the larger interval. So they're kind of localizing it. They're only looking at a small portion of the domain, and they're saying just in this little portion of the domain, do I have a min or a maximum versus the entire domain? So because they're only looking at a small portion of the domain, it's called relative. When they want the relative minimum or maximum, they're only looking at a small section of the domain. They're not looking at the entire domain. With me? Okay. Now, I've got one more theorem before we actually get into some examples. So stay tuned, I'll be right back. Okay, we have to have a couple more theorems and then we'll get to some examples. So let's look at the second theorem. The second theorem actually piggybacks off of the uh, definitions that we did just a few moments ago. So let's look at theorem two. It says, if a function f has a relative extrema, what does it mean by extrema? Extrema is the simple way of saying min or max. So if they say relative extrema, they mean relative min or relative max. So if a function f has a relative extrema value f of c on an open interval, then c is a critical value. So f prime of c equals 0 or f prime of c does not exist. So let me go back. I explained what relative extrema meant. The relative extrema value is f of c. So remember, C is the critical value, right? And they're plugging that critical value into the original function. That's going to give us a Y value. Agreed? Okay. And it's on an open interval, which means there are parentheses around it. C is a critical value so that the first derivative at C, what is this referring to? Yeah, this is the slope at C and it has to equal zero. 
or the slope at C doesn't exist. Good? All right. Theorem three. Theorem three is kind of a visual theorem. You'll, you'll, you'll see what I mean as we go through it. So first off, theorem three starts with any continuous function f. Means there's no breaks in it, right? It's a continuous function that has exactly one critical value, c, in this open interval a to b. So I've got this open interval, right? a to b. Open interval means there's parentheses here, right? They're not using a or b, but it's an open interval. And c is somewhere in that open interval. So I'm just going to put c here. It doesn't have to be in the middle, and I kind of didn't put it in the middle. So understand that. C is just somewhere in this open interval a to b. Now I've got three possibilities, so let's look at the first one, f1. f has a relative min at c if f prime of x is less than 0. Okay, so you're going to have to go back to that first theorem, right? When f prime of x is less than 0, then what's the function doing? Good, it's decreasing. So now I've got a decreasing function up until c. So that means on a to c. And f prime of x is greater than 0. What does that mean? What, what's, the function, what's the function look like if it, the first derivative at x is greater than 0? Yeah, that means it's increasing on the interval c to b. So this right here, this y value, is considered a relative min if on the first part of the interval, the left of c, it decreases, and on the right of c, it increases, which is exactly what it says here. In other words, f decreases to the left of c and increases to the right of c. Good? Okay, let's look at the second one. f has a relative max at c. If the first derivative is now greater than 0. So greater than 0 means it's doing what? Good. That means it's increasing. So let me get rid of this part. That means it's increasing on A to C. So now we've got something like this. And F prime, the first derivative of X is less than 0 on C to B. Yeah, that means it's decreasing, so now this is considered my relative max. In other words, f increases to the left of c and decreases to the right of c. Good? Okay, third one. f has neither a relative min or max at c if the first derivative, what? Has the same sign on a to c and c to b. You're like, well, wait. I don't understand. What does that look like? Okay. So here's my point C, right? This critical value. Here's the Y value that goes with it. That's the dot, right? Now, if from A to C my function is increasing, F prime of X is greater than zero from A to C, but on C to B, the first derivative is also greater than zero, which means it's increasing still. So it's increasing and increasing. There's no change. This isn't a relative min or max. Cool? By the same token, instead of increasing on both sides, maybe for on A to C it's decreasing, and on C to B it's still decreasing. It's not a relative min or max either. With me? Okay, good. Now, Stay tuned, because now we're going to put these into Okay, so now let's get into some examples. Notice the directions. It says find the relative extrema of the points of the function, and then sketch the graph. So here's our function, and they want us to find the relative extrema. Remember what it means by extrema, min, or max. Got it? Okay. So you're like, well, that's wonderful. How do I get started with this? Well, go back to theorem 2. Theorem 2 says that if you're going to have a relative extrema, then first off, you're going to have a critical value, right? So, to find the critical value, what do I need to take? Good, I need to take the first derivative. So here's the thing. First, find 
f prime of x. So as I do that, I end up with 2x plus 6. Agree? Okay. It also states that the critical value not only comes from the first derivative, but whatever the critical value is, it makes the first derivative equal what? Yeah, it equals 0. Because remember, the first derivative is the slope of the tangent line. And according to one of the uh, uh, theorems before, the tangent line needs to be horizontal. Horizontal means it has a zero slope, which means this first derivative needs to be equal to what? It needs to be equal to zero. So that means I am going to set this equal to zero and solve for x. And when I solve for x, I end up with x equaling a negative 3. So in this particular case, my critical value is a negative 3. Good? Okay. Now remember, this represents an x, yes? So if you have an x, and I know I'm going to be graphing, and then the critical value is going to be expanded into a point because I need to know what's going to happen on the left side of it and the right side of it so I can actually come up with a graph. So first things first, we found the first derivative. We set it equal to zero. Why? Because the critical value is supposed to make the first derivative equal to zero. So we found the critical value. Next thing we're going to do is find y. So, second, find y. So when I'm finding y, another name for y is f of x, isn't it? So to find that, you're going to take your critical value of negative 3, because it is an x, right? And you need to find the y that goes with it. Where are you going to plug that negative 3 into? Do you plug it into the first derivative or do you plug it into the original function? Good, you plug it into the original function because the original function is your y, correct? Okay, which means you're finding f of negative 3. So, make certain you put the parentheses where they are needed, and they are definitely needed around the negative 3, and then you're squaring it, right? Okay. So, 9 minus 18, negative 9, but good. That means in this case you get a negative 12. So, the point you just found is negative 3 comma negative 12. With me? Okay, so found the critical value, found the point that we're going to need to determine if this is a min or a max. And in actuality, if that y value is a min or a max. Cool? Okay. Now, to determine if this, y, if this is going to represent a minimum, a relative minimum, or a relative maximum, remember what, and let me put my negative infinities out here, right? Remember what we're supposed to do. We are supposed to determine if this side's increasing or decreasing, and this side is increasing or decreasing. So remember, first theorem says that if that first derivative of x is less than 0, it decreases. But if that first derivative of x is greater than 0, then it increases, right? Okay, so you're like, well, how do I determine that? Actually, quite simply. This is what we're going to do. We are going to choose a number. On this side, I'm going to choose a negative 4, because that's between negative infinity and negative 3. On this side, I am going to choose 0. It's the easier number to, easiest number to choose. And that's between negative 3 and infinity. And now I'm going to determine what happens at the first derivative. So we have x equal to negative 4. If I take the first derivative and evaluate it at negative 4, let's see what we get. So that's going to be 2 times the negative 4 plus 6. Agreed? Which gives me 
negative 2. Now, this means my first derivative at the negative 4 is less than 0, which means from negative infinity to negative 3, this function is going to do what? Increase or decrease? Yes, this one is going to decrease. Oops, got it? So it's going to decrease from negative infinity to negative 3. Good? Okay. On this side, we're allowing x to be equal to 0. And if I evaluate the first derivative at 0, we're going to have 2 times 0 plus the 6, which equals 6, right? So my first derivative evaluated at 0 is a positive number, it is definitely greater than 0, right, because 6 is greater than 0, which means, correct, on this side it's going to increase. So in this case, from negative 3 to infinity, it's actually going to increase. Good? Okay, now, let's complete the graph based upon the information I found. So, at this point, negative 3, negative 12, because that's the point I'm working with, and that's going to be down here somewhere, negative 3 comma negative 12, according to what the work we did here, from negative infinity to negative 3, this is going to decrease. So it's going to look something like this. And by the way, since this is the only critical value, I know that nothing else is happening in between negative infinity and negative 3, that it's definitely going to decrease. And from negative 3 to infinity, again, negative 3 being my only critical value, I know from negative infinity to infinity, pardon me, negative 3 to infinity, nothing else is happening but an increase. Make sense? And by the way, if I look at the original function, isn't this a parabola facing up? And that's exactly the graph I got, didn't I? So here's my question to you. Do I have, based upon this graph, do I have a relative maximum or relative minimum? Yes, I have a relative minimum. And the relative minimum is y equals negative 12, and it occurs at x equaling negative 3. Does that make sense? Okay, quick recap. They gave us a function, wanted us to find the relative extrema. How do we do it? Based upon theorem 2, we've got to find the first derivative. And that first derivative is going to help me find the critical value because the first derivative must equal 0. And the critical value that's going to make this first derivative equal 0 is negative 3. Then I plug negative 3 into the original function so I could find the y value that goes with it. And then I did a quick little sketch. All I graphed was my x-axis. And I chose a number between negative infinity and negative 3. Since this was the only critical value, it split the x-axis into two pieces. So on this side, I chose negative 4 and plugged it into the first derivative. Because theorem 1 says if your first derivative turns out to be less than 0, then the function is going to decrease, which is what happened to the left of the negative 3. And when I looked at the right side of negative 3, I chose 0. And since my first derivative was greater than 0, it increased. So I knew this side was going to increase, which gave me a relative minimum at y equals negative 12. And it occurred at x equals negative 3. Cool? You're like, why is it at neg y equals negative 12 and not the whole point? OK, so when we think, think min and maxes, we think this direction. And this direction, because if it's a minimum or a maximum, we're talking about a high and a low. Isn't that the y direction? That's why my relative minimum or maximum is a y, and it occurs at an x value. I'll say that one more time. Your relative min or max is a y value, 
and it occurs at an x value. Cool? Stay tuned. Let's look at this next problem. It's still asking for a relative extrema. So, to find the relative extrema, what do I need first? Good, I need the critical value first. And how do I find the critical value? I need the first derivative because the first derivative needs to be equal to zero, right? Okay, so first find the f prime of x, right? Find the first derivative to establish the critical value. So the first derivative of x here, I get negative x squared uh, plus 6x minus 9. Agreed? Okay, and now to find that critical value, remember the first derivative must be equal to 0. Remember, that's the second theorem. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't like the negative in front of the x squared, so I'm going to multiply both sides by a negative. Gratefully, that doesn't do anything to the 0, but it does make this uh, right side a little bit nicer to deal with. How do I solve a second degree equation? Good, you either factor it or solve by the quadratic formula. I don't care which way you do it. Me personally, I'm going to factor it because this one's nice and easy to factor. So that is good for us. And remember, you said each one of these equal to zero. And since they're duplicates, I know that my x is going to be equal to 3, and I'm going to get it twice, right? Which means I actually have how many critical values? Yeah, just one. It appears twice, but there's just one, right? Because you don't have the number 3 on the number line more than one time. Okay, so found the critical value of 3. Now what? Good. I'm going to have to find the y that goes with it. I'm going to have to find the point that goes with it, aren't I? So, second is we're going to find the y value, which is f of x, the original function, right? All right. So, f of 3 equals, and please, make sure you plug it in. Put the parentheses where they belong. It's going to help you when you're computing this or finger punching into the calculator, which I hope you're not doing because this one's actually quite easy to work with. So let's see. 3 cubed? Yeah, 27. Divide by negative 3. Good. Negative 9 plus 27 minus 27 plus 2. What do we get? Yeah, we get a negative 7. So we just found the point, and the point is 3, because that was the critical, and negative 7 on the y. So that's the point I'm working with. Good? All right. Now what? Yeah, I've got to find where it increases and decreases, doesn't it? Because that's going to actually help me find if I have a relative min or a relative max. Agreed? All right, so we can say next or third because I went first and second. So this is third, right? Um, what did we say? Oh, that's right. Find where it increases and decreases. So again, in this particular case, I only have one critical value, and that's the number three. It may have appeared, appeared twice, but there's only one critical value. So... How do I determine where it increases and decreases? Good, I've got to use the first derivative, but pick a number. So give me a number between negative infinity and 3. Yeah, I like the 0 also. It's easy. 0 cancels just about everything, or 0 cancels everything out, doesn't it? And how about the 3 and the infinity? Okay, let's choose 4. Now remember, what are we going to do with these numbers? Good. To decide if they increase or decrease, we have to plug it into the first derivative. Remember, theorem 1 says to determine if the function increases or decreases, you plug it into the first derivative. So here's my first derivative. I'm going to plug 0 in, which gives me, yeah, negative 9, right? 
which means in this particular case, when I plugged in the zero, this is less than zero. The first derivative value is less than zero. Good, that means it decreases, doesn't it? Okay, so I know from negative infinity to positive three, this is a decrease. The other one, x equals four, plug it again into the first derivative. This one I think we have a little more work to do, right? So the negative outside the four squared, because you're only squaring the x, and the negative is hanging out front, waiting for you to recognize it. Six times four minus the nine, what are we getting? Good, negative 16 plus 24 minus nine, good, what is that gonna give me? Negative one, excellent. So in this particular case, our first derivative is less than zero, so this is decreasing again, right? So on the interval from three to infinity, it's still decreasing, isn't it? So that point was three negative seven. Let me just plot it here. And according to what we found, from negative three to, pardon me, from negative infinity to three, it's decreasing. And then from three to infinity, it's still decreasing, isn't it? It keeps going down, doesn't it? So question, do I have a relative extrema? Correct, I do not. Remember theorem three says, that third one says, if the sign's not changing, you have no relative extrema. And this graph proves it because it doesn't bottom out like problem number one or it doesn't top out. So in this case, no relative extrema. By the way, if I take a look at this particular function and I actually look at its graph, it looks like something that we've gotten here, right? Okay, good so far? Yeah, this was a really good example of when you don't have a relative extrema. Stay tuned though, I still have another problem. Here's our next problem. Same directions, find the relative extrema. So what do we need to do first? Good, we need to find the critical value. How? Take the first derivative. Okay, so first things first. First, find g prime of x to establish the critical value. All right, so first off, I don't like the cubed root there, so I'm gonna rewrite this as x plus two to the one third power. We've done that before, haven't we? And now I'm ready to take the first derivative. So I bring the power down. I reduce by one, which is how I get the negative two thirds, because one third minus one, right? And then I've got to take the derivative of x plus two, which is one. So in this particular case, my first derivative looks like one over three times x plus two to the two thirds power. Remember that negative two thirds meant it went in the denominator, didn't it? Okay, so found the first derivative, now what? You have to set it equal to zero, don't you? Because that's how you're gonna find the actual critical value, agreed? So I'm gonna set this equal to zero and when we solve, what's one of the first things we do when we have a fraction? Yeah, we get rid of the denominator, don't we? Okay, so this isn't going to change. I'm going to get rid of the denominator, which means we're going to multiply both sides by this, aren't we? So multiply both sides by the 3 times the quantity of x plus 2 to the 2 thirds. And when we do this, it cancels out the denominator on the right side. See ya. And on the left, which gives us just a one here, and on the left side, yeah, that's still gonna just be equal to zero, isn't it? So this is interesting. Do I have a critical value? 
Yeah, in this case, I don't have a, I don't, my, my first derivative doesn't exist, does it? This really doesn't exist because when I solved, I didn't get anything, right? Okay, so do you remember that second part of theorem 2 where it says f prime of x does not exist? This is that case. So you're like, well, now what do I do? Here's what we do. Since I end up with 0 equaled 1, I can't find a critical value this way. So to find the critical value, that second part says f prime of x does not exist. So when I, whoops, sorry, we're not dealing with f here, we're dealing with g, aren't we? Regardless, the second part of theorem 2 says that your first derivative does not exist. So in this particular case, when I look at my first derivative, my question is, the question I need to answer is this. What value of x is going to make this fraction undefined? Because that would make it not exist. Agreed? So again, what value of x would make this fraction undefined, which means my first derivative won't exist? Yeah, x equaling negative 2. This will make my first derivative not exist, which will make it, which, pardon me, x equal negative 2 will make this first derivative undefined, which means my first derivative is not going to exist. So in this particular case, since I couldn't find a critical value like I did with the first two problems, I had to go to the second half of that, defin that theorem, which said, well then, look where f prime doesn't exist. My first derivative will not exist when x equals negative 2, which means in this case, my critical value is actually a negative 2. Good? And if I plugged it in, because I still have to find the y, so to find the y, we're going to do g of negative 2, and when we plug that in, we're basically taking the cube root of 0, which is 0, which means the point we're working with is negative 2 comma 0. Good? With me? Yeah, this was a good example. This showed doing our, our normal routine where x basically cancels out and I don't I can't find my critical value this direction, which means I've got to look at where the first derivative doesn't exist. And when I look at my first derivative, it won't exist when x equals negative 2 because it'll make the fraction undefined, which means the first derivative won't exist. And then I'm going to plug it in still to find the y, and my y is 0. So now here is the point I am working with. And I've got to figure out if this point is going to represent a relative min or relative max. Got it? Okay. So now our third step, so to speak, right? Because finding the y was our second step. Our third step is as usual. There's my critical value of negative 2. I am going to choose a number on either side of this negative 2, and I'm going to see where this lands us, right? All right, so when x equals negative 3, where do we plug that into? We plug it into the first derivative. So let's see. We have g prime of negative 3 equaling... 1 over 3 times negative 3 plus 2 to the 2 third power. Okay. So inside the parentheses you get what? Negative 1. And now you've got to take negative 1 to the 2 thirds. Right? Which means you get to square it, which is a positive 1, and you take the cube root of a positive 1, which is 1 which means I basically just get a one-third here, don't I? Okay. Yeah, that one increases because it's a positive number, isn't it? 
All right, over on this side, by the way, I'm going to change my mind about choosing a zero because since I've got to plug it in here and take the two-thirds power, I want a number that's going to be a little nicer to work with. So I think I'm going to choose a negative one. I think this will be easier for us to compute without a calculator. Okay, so negative one plus two to the two-thirds. What's negative one plus two? One. Now I gotta take it to the two-thirds power. So one squared, one, cubed root of one, one, which means I get one-third, which means it's increasing again, isn't it? Yeah, so if it's increasing, and this is at negative two, zero, right? That's the actual point, negative two, zero, which means it increases and keeps increasing. Do I have a relative extrema? Yeah, no relative extrema in this case. Got it? No relative extrema. In this particular instance, because of the way we had to find the critical value, this means we may actually have a vertical tangent line right here at that point, negative two, zero. And a vertical tangent line doesn't really help. Cool? Stay tuned. Got a story for 